Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. Climate change, ocean acidification, exponential economies, shrinking aquifers, species extinction. What do all of these things have in common? Besides being depressing, I mean. Everyone is being driven by the same underlying cause. Population. Or, rather, too many people for the local ecology and resources to bear. Some 70 to 80 million new people are added to the world's population every year. Now imagine nine new New York cities popping up every year, and you've got an idea of the scale of the additions. Now talking about population, though, is not a very popular thing to do, at least judging by the number of organizations dedicated to trying to mitigate the effects of population, yet never talking about population itself. Well, today we've got a guest who is anything but afraid to tackle the issue, Paul Ehrlich, author of the 1968 book, The Population Bomb, who is well known for his dire warnings about population growth and limited resources. He is the Bing Professor of Population Studies in the Department of Biological Sciences at Stanford University and President of Stanford Center for Conservation Biology. Welcome, Paul. It's a real honor to have you on our show. Nice to be here. Well, the world seems to be up to its eyeballs in predicaments, a few of which I mentioned in the intro. And most, I think, can be directly traced back to population. Is that fair? It's fair to say that if we had a much smaller population, we would have many fewer problems. It's not, of course, just how many people you have, but how they behave. So that, uh, contrary to most people's uh, view of things, uh, we probably have much too many rich people in the world and too many poor people, uh, because the rich people each uh, cause more ecological damage uh, than each poor person. But basically, the drivers are the scale of the the drivers of the problems that we face are largely the scale of the human enterprise, and that scale is a function of how many people we have, how much each one consumes, and what technologies we choose uh, for the consumption. So uh, population is properly discussed as the elephant in the room because it's not properly discussed. Well, it really isn't, and a lot has changed since 1968 when the population bomb was written. So what are your views on population today? Well, they're much more grim because, of course, when the population bomb was written, there were 3.5 billion people on the planet. Now there are 7.3 billion people on the planet. And uh, we are projected, and of course the projections may not be followed, uh, to have something on the order of 9.6 billion people 35 years from now. That means that we're scheduled to add to the population many more people than were alive when I was born in 1932. When I was born, uh, there were 2 billion people. By Just by coincidence, I happen to have been the 2 billionth person born. Uh, Mm -hmm. But the the idea that in 35 years, when we already have billions of people hungry or micronutrient malnourished, we're going to have to somehow take care of 2.5 billion more people is kind of a daunting idea. And not just 2.5 billion more, but... uh... I'm noting as well a lot of trends showing that more and more people are joining the middle class, which is a fine and worthy pursuit, but a middle class person consumes a lot more than a lower than middle class person. So we're seeing not just more people, but more people wanting the good life, as it were, wanting the Western life. I can't fault that. I live a Western life myself, but at the same time, it's obvious that we're already seeing strains at 7.2 billion people. What what do you think happens when we go to, to 9 billion? Well, uh, I think it's going to get a lot worse for a lot more people. you got to remember not only what you just pointed out, but, of course, each person we add uh, disproportionately causes ecological damage. For example, human beings are smart. And so uh, human beings use the easiest to get to, the purest, the finest resources first. You know, when when, uh, thousands of years ago we started to fool around with copper, Copper was lying on the surface of the earth essentially poor. Now we have a, at least one mine that goes down almost two miles uh, and is mining copper that's about uh, 3% ore, in other words, 97% rock, and yet we go that deep 
uh, and we and we refine that much. Same thing. The first oil well, commercial oil well in the United States, uh, went down 69 and a half feet in 1859 to hit oil. The one in the uh, that went off in the Gulf of Mexico started a mile underwater and went down a couple more miles. Uh, before it had the blowout that, that, that tended to ruin the Gulf of Mexico. So each person you add has to be fed from, on average, poorer land, drink water that has to be carted, more, pumped from deeper wells or transported further or purified more, have their materials uh, from other poor, <coughs> poorer resources. And so there's a disproportion there. And when you figure that we're going to try and have to try and feed several billion more people and that the agricultural system itself, the food system, supplies something like 30% of the greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere, and those greenhouse gases are changing the climate rapidly, and rapid climate change is the big energy, a big enemy of agriculture, you can see that we're really heading down, uh, you know, a, a road that leads to a bridge that's out, and we're not paying any attention to trying to apply the brakes. You know, I, I share that view, and and I have to ask this. You know, some say that your your dire warnings were so far off the mark in '68. Uh, surely you must be equally off base today, or, or something like that. H how do you respond to your critics? Well, first of all, many of the things that are reported as were, which were predictions in 1968. Uh, were actually scenarios. In other words, mm -hmm. if you look at the population bomb, it'll say what, follow, <clears throat> what follows are not predictions. They're little stories about the future that won't come true, but will help you think about it. Uh, another recently, uh, some uh, colleagues wrote an article which pointed out that if you are not exact in your timing when you're predicting things that are going to be unhappy in the future, you still ought to examine the predictions carefully and consider how valid they are. After all, in 1934, Churchill said, uh, we have a very short time, only a year or so, uh, to prevent the disaster of the Nazis taking over Europe. Well, he was off by two or three times, but he was fundamentally right. And I don't worry about whether or not I'm right or not in the, you know, whether Rush Limbaugh thinks I'm wrong uh, or uh, can't remember the name of the idiot, Walker, who's uh, running for the Republican uh, presidency and fighting uh, family planning, but as long as my colleagues in science think I'm right, and I have all of my stuff reviewed, peer-reviewed by the best people in the world, uh, nobody can be absolutely 100% right in all predictions, but both my uh, and Anne's predictions and those of the uh, Club of Rome in the uh, limits to growth, when people look at them closely, they find they're right on the mark. We're having the problems that were predicted. After all, in the population bomb, I, we talked about whether or not there was going to be climate change and whether that was going to be serious. That was 1968. Uh, so uh, I'll stand by uh, my record. Some things, I, if, if I were 100% right <clears throat> in predictions about the future, then we wouldn't be having this conversation because I, I would have bought low, sold high, and probably bought the island of Bora Bora and be living there now with a few close friends um, and some beautiful young women. <laughs> and uh, and boy, I, I would petition heartily to join you there. Uh, so, and being well, your you wife, a lot of applications, you know. <laughs> I, I I know I know. Uh, a lot of people say that they want to join me at my house if things ever go bad, and I, I let them know that it's a very small club. Uh, so I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see. Uh, so, you, you mentioned Anne. That's your wife, Anne, and. Um, I want to talk about a paper that, that you recently co-authored. Uh, it's entitled, Can a Collapse of Global Civilization Be Avoided? It's, it's a relatively new paper. Um, what's, well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is, uh, yes, it could. I'm very optimistic, as is Anne, about the things we could do. Science has very clearly diagnosed our problem. We know what needs to be done. Uh, but the big problem is, will we do it? And we're not doing it now. So I tend to be very optimistic about being able to work hard and probably prevent an utter disaster, uh, but I'm very pessimistic uh, when you look at the people running for office in our country, for example, uh, that will actually do it. Uh, and it's a good example, by the way, that paper uh, was published by uh, arguably the most distinguished scientific society in the world, the Royal Society of London, 
uh, which is the British equivalent of our National Academy of Sciences, uh, and was, of course, heavily reviewed by the best scientists in the world. Uh, and so one of the really silly things is that in countries like the United States and Great Britain and in uh, some of my other favorite countries like um, New Zealand, Australia, which is our second home, Canada, uh, the scientific community knows exactly what's going on and the governments are ignoring it. I mean, just consider uh, from the days of Lester Pearson that now we have Canada and New Zealand and Australia run by total idiots and 15 total idiots lined up to try and run the United States. Uh, it's really scary. I mean, the, the, the point is, this is now no longer a scientific problem. It's a political problem. Sure, we could do a lot of research and learn a lot more, but the basics of what we have to do are crystal clear. We've got to, for example, give equal rights and opportunities to women everywhere because we know from empirical data that when you do that, the total fertility rate comes down. We know we have to stop burning fossil fuels as our main way of mobilizing energy. Uh, we know that every sexually active human being should have access to modern contraception and safe backup abortion. That, that alone would save millions of lives, uh, but it's not being done. So we know what needs to be done, and they're all things that are politically extremely difficult. So this whole thing has really transformed from a natural science problem to a social science problem and a cultural problem and a communications problem. And you at least are trying to solve part of the communications problem end of it. Well, it's, it's always, it struck me that it's not about the data anymore. We have all the data we need. It, it becomes a, more of a psychological problem, really. It's about how people process beliefs or rather uh, fail to. And uh, beliefs are stubborn things. You know, they go out and gather data that supports them and they vigorously refute and defend data that doesn't support them. And it has, it becomes completely illogical. I mean, we can just look at, um, for instance, the so-called drug war, right? There's lots of empirical data now, including Portugal, which said, hey, this isn't a criminal problem if we treat this as a social problem. In fact, what these addicts are mostly missing in life is a sense of connection. And when we can start to help them rebuild that sense of connection to self, to nature, to other humans, look, they no longer have the need for drugs. Boom, their drug use uh, went way, way down. And uh, the total cost of the thing went uh, went uh, uh, really on in the positive direction for them as a country. We have lots of data on something like that, uh, which which seemingly is just about the human condition. Not even as tricky as saying, can I empathize with a plate of phytoplankton? You know, that's a step too far. No, maybe. no, it's Correct. I mean, the drug war, first of all, everybody with any sense knows we've lost it. Uh, so uh, something really ought to be done. But just like with climate change and the drug war, you have people who make uh, their livings or make fortunes um, out of the other side of it. So if you're a narco trafficante, you don't want us to solve the drug problem. Uh, if you're Shell Oil or BP or somebody like that, you don't want to stop burning fossil fuels. After all, I think it was, I can't remember, one of the big oil companies knew perfectly well that what they were doing was changing the climate, that it was extremely dangerous, and nonetheless, uh, they have been funding deniers, idiots and, and uh, prostitutes, who will get up there and say, uh, you know, there's no problem with climate. It's uncertain whether the climate is changing. It's uncertain whether human beings are causing it. Turns out, if you've read Naomi Oreskes' wonderful book, the merchants of doubt, it's linearly the same idiots who were paid by the cigarette companies to say uh, it's uncertain whether or not cigarettes were harmful to you and on and on. I mean, the, the degree to which people will uh, adopt denial if it makes them comfortable uh, is quite stunning. I, I'm sometimes amazed by the people who sue the cigarette companies claiming they didn't know it was harmful. I started smoking when I was six or seven years old. And what we did then, this was in the 1930s, we, I picked up butts on the street with my friends, and we smoked them, and uh, we called them coffin nails. You know, at seven years old, I and anybody else with any sense knew smoking was bad for you. Uh, but you, uh, if you enjoy something, you go ahead and do it anyway. Now, and it's make money. You know. I'd like to uh, build on that and talk about then what I consider to be one of the strongest forms of denial that we've got. And it goes like this. <laughs> Um, my, my business partner, Adam, and I, we joke about this. We call it the iPhone moment. So I'll be reviewing a bunch of data and I'll say, look, 
Uh, oil discoveries peaked in the 1960s. That's 50 some years in the rearview mirror. And that's just the data. And people will whip out their smartphones and go, but you're forgetting about these, Chris, meaning technology. Technology is somehow going to save us. Uh, it will do something. It will somehow create energy instead of just help us find it. I don't know what their thinking is, uh, but we call it the iPhone moment. And what it's really saying is we have an, a, a really powerful faith in our ability to be clever monkeys and that we're going to clever our way out of that. How, how, do, you, how do you respond to that? And, and do you run into this? I, uh, I'd like to think it was true, but I know that it isn't. In fact, uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you some of the papers you discussed, but the one that the Royal Society published, if I recall correctly, actually goes over uh, the technological fixes that were, we were told back in 1968 that we were dead wrong because we were going to build nuclear agro-industrial complexes that were going to feed everybody in abundance. We were going to uh, we were going to herd whales in atolls so we could feed everybody in abundance. We were going to grow algae on sewage and eat the algae so everybody could be fed in abundance. Although I always thought the the growers and the eaters would probably be different people and so on. Whereas we have there was going to be uh, uh, <coughs> leaf protein just gathered from leaves all over the world that was going to feed everybody in abundance. And we were told repeatedly in those days that there was no problem. We had three and a half billion people, but we could easily feed four billion or five billion or six billion or seven billion, on and on and on. Here we are at 7.3 billion, and we have roughly 800 million starving each year and one to two billion micronutrient malnourished to the point where they don't function uh, very well. Uh, and so uh, I, I get really tired of hearing how we're going to fix it for huge numbers of people in the future. And our answer to these people every time has been, maybe so, but why don't you show that you can feed the people we've got today good diets? And they'll say, well, it's just a distribution problem. I said, okay, solve the distribution problem. But the point is, people are starving. Uh, and you're still telling us how many more people we ought to have and how easy it will be to take care of them. Uh, we're not taking care of the people of the world today. What, who could possibly believe that adding 2.5 billion people in the next 35 years is going to be easy to take care of all of them and eat, you know, feed them? What about feeding the couple billion that are starving today that are not properly fed today? So, yeah, technology can help in some circumstances, uh, but it certainly has never shown any sign of being able to solve the problem. Basic problem is human behavior. And uh, that behavior includes uh, over-reproduction, over-consumption, not caring for your neighbors, inequity. Uh, again, why don't we solve the problem of giving women equal rights? Would that be so extremely difficult? We can't even get the women sometimes to help with that. You know, we, if we'd had more women on our side, we would have had an equal rights amendment in the United States. So uh, it's, we're working with the wrong animal. Uh, do you know what a bonobo is? Sure do. Yeah, well... Uh, we should emulate the Monomos. For example, they solve their problems, their, their battles, their disputes with genital rubbing. And I think that's something that we could take up. <laughs> so for anybody else who doesn't know, uh, it, it's, it's our closest relative, as it turns out, genetically. Uh, and it looks like a small chimp. Um, and, and they have uh, very interesting group dynamics that if we studied them, I do believe that we might dis uh, discover something in our DNA blueprint. And, and uh, there are other ways to resolve conflicts. So maybe we could go Better that way. Or every time. <laughs> well, let's, um, you know, I, I, I didn't uh, do it in advance of this interview, but I, I, it would take me a, three seconds to Google up and find articles where people are talking about how we don't have a population problem of too many people, but they're worried about population growth rates leveling off. They're worried about not having enough humans one of their arguments being more humans means more cleverness. Well, that, that'll save something. And I'm not sure if the rest was written by real estate agents or developers. I don't know. But uh, have, you, have you encountered those articles and tried to refute them? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> There's no, you don't even have to try to refute them. In other words, these, these, uh, among others, is a bunch of uh, political leaders in Europe who are worried about the aging of the population. It is a mathematical fact that if you have a rapidly growing population, uh, and you then start exercising restraint and have fewer births, that the average age in the population will increase. 
And this is often talked about by uh, dumb politicians and idiot economists by saying, we're going to face a terrible problem because of the dependency ratio. That is, uh, the number of people who are, the, the dependency ratio is defined as the number of people who are under 15 uh, plus those that are over 65 <clears throat> dividing by the ones that are between 16 and uh, between 15 and 65. And it's perfectly true that the number of people over 65 will increase. And this is viewed as a problem because, of course, then so there's, there's more people on Social Security, uh, and therefore you have a problem because there are fewer earners compared to those that are, uh, uh, those that are on Social Security. Well, it's true. Uh, you cannot avoid the problem of a, the change in age structure if you stop population growth. Uh, so in one sense, the only way to solve that problem is to keep the population growing forever. If you slow down population growth, it doesn't grow forever, then you're going to have more older people. Uh, so point one is uh, if you think that you can solve a problem by having the human population on a finite planet grow forever, then basically what you need is medical help and there's nothing I can do for you. Uh, the second point is, of course, that the zero to uh, 15 age class shrinks. You get more old people, but you get fewer young people who have to support. And actually it turns out that it's much easier to make a person over 65 economically um, productive than it is to make, say, somebody under six economically productive. So the, the big result of too many people uh, who cannot be performed economically compared to those who have to support them is nowhere near as bad um, as is usually presented. In fact, it's one of those problems that with some foresight, any nation can solve very easily. It means uh, it's part of the general economic problem and you have to figure it in. But it's absolutely inevitable unless you're insane, uh, and it's nowhere near as bad uh, as, uh, as it's ordinarily presented. Uh, in fact, for instance, if you look at the statistics in countries like the United States, people who don't retire at 65 who remain economically productive tend to live longer in many circumstances than those that retire at 65. So the, the, whole, the whole structure can be changed uh, to solve that problem. But it's a problem that's built in to mathematics. There's nothing at all you can do to change the fact that if the population stops growing, its age composition is going to change, and there's going to be proportionally more old people, no question about it. Yeah, you know, the, it's the math problem that, that sort of drives me a little bit nuts because a lot of this seems not even like complex math. It's, it's fairly simple math. I did have the, the great pleasure of having uh, Albert Bartlett attend one of my talks where I was using liberally from, from his wonderful talks on exponential growth. And uh, as I look at this, it really, a lot of it feels to me, Paul, like, like uh, the tail wags the dog where the economists and all of the people who are invested in the economy have bought into an idea, which is that the economy has to constantly grow. And if it doesn't, it's threatening collapse. That's actually true. That's an observation. But instead of saying, wow, we've saddled ourselves with an economy and a monetary system that's either growing or collapsing, that seems like maybe we should fix that. Uh, we're putting everything we possibly can into assuring that we don't have to confront the inevitable reality of that. Uh, it just, it seems, is there a better definition of insane out there? Oh, well, actually, uh, Al was great. He died recently, as you probably know. Yeah. But um, I think he was the one uh, who uh, uh, said that, uh, that um, exponential growth is the creed of the cancer cell. There was a very smart economist uh, quite a ways back who said if you can believe in uh, infinite growth on a finite planet, uh, you're either a madman or an economist. And uh, that, that unhappily remains true. And the interesting reason is uh, there was a study done by Colander and Clammer, two uh, economists who looked at the training of economists and economists get essentially no natural science they have no idea uh, how human beings are supported on the planet what makes the planet livable uh, what the demographic issues are and so on they're just given a basically silly model a model for instance that believes that everybody makes their economic choices rationally when uh, biologists have shown and psychologists have shown 
many years ago that that's exactly wrong, that our decision-making is much more controlled by emotion than by rationality. So they have a silly model uh, which is based on a physical, a biophysical impossibility, that is infinite growth, but trying to wean them from it. But not, this is, by the way, there's some extremely smart economists who know better, uh, but they're not the ones that are hired by uh, the Wall Street Journal or the Australian or uh, Fox News and so on to talk to people. So the, the average economist and even some of the smart ones are absolutely growth fixated and it is, seems to be very little you can do about it. I mean, when you listen to any commentator on the economic situation, their cure for problems is never redistribution. It's always grow more. Doesn't matter that the, uh, you know, the Ronald Reagan's hood robin system, which was designed to steal money from the poor and give it to the rich, is still functioning very well. And if you think the rich are going to do something when they control the media and so on, uh, in order to change it, you're whistling in the dark. I mean, you're you're asking them uh, to stop being the recipients of the money being stolen from the poor. Well, come on, what are the chances? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, there's a. Uh, I totally agree with all of that. There, there's a background reason for for why I do what I I do, and uh, I haven't shared this very widely. But one of my habits in life is that if I ever am driving along or I'm on, on a bike or anything, and I see a turtle in the road. I will get off and get or get out and I will move it in the direction it was traveling to help it across the road. And uh, there was a period of time around 2003 or four where I realized I hadn't stopped in almost 10 years. And it wasn't because uh, I had just driven past turtles and I'd stopped caring. It was I hadn't seen any. And this is in New England, you know, so there are wood turtles, box turtles, sometimes some snappers, painted sliders, things like that. And it suddenly occurred to me that in my lifetime, what was a very common thing, which was finding and, and seeing turtles, which were a big part of my childhood because I was just playing outside all the time, they were suddenly disappearing. And I realized, oh, my goodness, uh, this, I would love to do something about this. But I realized that, you know, if you labeled yourself as an environmentalist, mm, all of us, there's a lot of baggage associated with that. So one of my thinkings was, how do I, how do I communicate this concern in a way that I can begin to talk about it? And one thing led to another. Next thing I know, I'm talking about the economy because everybody cares about their pocketbook, and, and, and that's true. But once you start to crack open one set of belief systems, which is, hey, did you know how money's created? A lot of people don't know. And you say, look, it's just created out of thin air. Even people who are international bankers have said, I had no idea, right? Uh, it's astonishing. It's a simple thing. We don't teach it in schools for obvious reasons. It's kind of a, a dangerous idea to get out there. So I'm looking at a piece of work that you've done uh, recently, and I, I want to talk about some of this data because I think this really is part of what's, what's I, I know a lot of people who are very anxious right now without really knowing why. And I'm going to, I'm going to suggest something a little goofy, which is that on some level, people are aware that we're killing the planet and we're part of that planet. We're organisms of, by, and for, and with it. And I think that when, when we're, we're, basically eroding our primary support structure that feels uncomfortable and it should right so you've got a paper out recently uh co-authored one on on the sixth mass extinction i've seen a lot of the headlines what i saw in your paper was that you you were looking to put numbers behind the claims and observations and i'm looking at one of the charts produced in that paper and it shows five lines on it one is for the background rate of extinction and four others show the actual extinction rates for bird mammal vertebrate and other vertebrate classifications. And so that background line, it's low and steady and linear. And the other four lines are all hockey sticks. And they seem to align quite well with the human population curve if I were gonna superimpose it mentally on there. Um, so uh, is, 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 that, is, is, is that the prime conclusion of this? A, that, that we've got these horrific um, extinction rates and B, that, that uh, we can tie it to humans? Well, the claims have been made in the past. <laughs> of course, biologists have been very much concerned about the extinction rates now for about 40 or 50 years. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to get accurate data to make really detailed comparisons of the background rate, which is simply the rate between the mass extinctions. In other words, we know actually when you had your original geology course and you learned about the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, et cetera, et cetera, those boundaries in the geological record are mostly extinction events. That is, people named when you had a, a, a layered record of fossils. When the fossils change suddenly, uh, the, the makeup of the fossil community, 
that was a good place to name the end of a geological period. The most famous recent one, and I say recent in quotes, is the one about 65 to 66 million years ago when all of the dinosaurs except for the birds were wiped out along with a lot of the rest of the organisms of the planet. And as probably most of your listeners know, uh, there's good evidence that it was caused by the collision of an extraterrestrial body with the planet, which caused uh, basically a nuclear winter over the entire planet uh, and wiped out, among other things, I say the dinosaurs. Uh, but the uh, again, figuring what the background rate was involves having a very good fossil record, the background rate being the normal rate of extinctions. In other words, when there's no extraterrestrial body coming or huge volcanic event or the sorts of things that have caused the mass extinctions, uh, normally uh, organisms are going extinct all the time and new ones are evolving over periods of millions of years. For instance, to restore the kind of diversity that there was before the mass extinction 65 million years ago took something like 15 million years to get most of it back. So it's a slow process, but the issue has been what are the relative rates of extinction and speciation, that is production of new organisms, uh, in between the mass events. And a colleague at Berkeley, Tony Jet Barnowski and his group did a very, very thorough study of the background rate, that is the rate between big events uh, in the fossil record uh, of vertebrates, particularly mammals, and got some very, very good estimates, which were very conservative. Conservative meaning that uh, the rates, the background rate that they came up with was faster than the usual background rate. Now, in order to see if we're going into a mass extinction today, uh, what you would have to show is that the background rate, the rate today, is far above the background rate historically, prehistorically, if you wish. Uh, so what we did was take his conservatively fast background rate and then calculated a conservatively slow present rate. That is, we only considered things that were known to be extinct, even though there are many, many, many organisms that are thought to have disappeared, but we don't have enough biologists checking to see if, for example, in some corner of the Amazon basin, something that is thought to be extinct is actually holding on. So we had a conservatively fast estimate for what went on in the distant past and a conservatively slow estimate for what's going on today. And the answer is somewhere between 10 and 1,000 times more rapid are the extinction rates today. In other words, a vastly more rapid rate than occurred in between the mass extinctions in the past, and that indicates that we're having a mass extinction today. We're starting a mass extinction, and it's very easy to see why. First of all, uh, we're observing huge numbers of population extinctions. The rate of extinctions of populations, of not different species, but populations within species, is now obviously thousands of times faster than the rate of extinction of species. The one estimate that came out recently is that in the last, I think it's half, uh, 50, 60 years, we've lost half of the wildlife on the planet. Uh, the rates are horrendous, uh, and we're not doing anything about it, even though those other organisms are the working parts of our life support systems. In other words, we're sawing off the limb that we're sitting on, and we now have very conservative estimates uh, of how we're doing it. And you probably have noticed other things. If you're a Northeasterner, and you've been, have you been around for 40 years yet? Yep. Well, remember in the old days, you used to get these beautiful silkworm moths uh, that would come to lights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I was a kid in the Northeast, I used to go out and find their cocoons, take them home, and you would have this absolutely gorgeous moth with maybe a seven or eight inch wing spread uh, emerge from the cocoon. They're basically all gone now. Uh, wiped out by uh, parasites that we've moved in to try and control other moths and probably by streetlights, which attract them and kill them. Um, so, uh, you know, biodiversity is going, but biodiversity is the working parts of our life support systems. Uh, the bats are disappearing from uh, a disease. Bats control huge numbers of not only agricultural pests, but also disease-bearing organisms. The 
one of the reasons we're having more and more trouble with various viruses is that the bats that normally control the mosquitoes are disappearing. Uh, we are lacking the, uh, <clears throat> the pollinators that we need. There's been a lot of publicity about that. Uh, and if we lose the populations of um, honeybees that we that now substitute for the other things we've wiped out in North America, it'll cost us something like $15 billion and greatly reduce the nutritional value of our diets. Uh, but the pollinators are going, the bees are in deep trouble, in part because we're using a new kind of insecticide uh, that, that hits them very hard. So you don't, don't have to imagine why we're having this mass extinction. Human beings are destroying habitats and over-harvesting organisms and poisoning the planet. Uh, and guess what? We're killing off the other living things. Sorry, my, I had pneumonia and my voice disappeared, so I'm having a little trouble. Oh, well, I, well, well, well thank you for your, uh, for your resilience and, and keeping on with it, uh, the interview. Um, yeah, we we and, and at our site, I've written extensively about the neonicotinoids, and and it's a really shocking case when you just look into that as a as a case study. You know, we had Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, DDT, all of that. We're doing it again. The neonicotinoids are not a pesticide; they're a biocide. They they wipe out all kinds of things, and it's just a truly horrendous uh, pesticide. Hey, they're related to the nicotine that has contributed to wiping out the human beings. <laughs> well, yes, and so we you might... know, by the way. Uh, I was very active uh, in the battles about DDT back around the 1960s and early 70s. And one of the things we were concerned about is that we had levels of DDT in mother's milk that were so high that the mother's milk couldn't legally be sold as cow's milk. Uh, and everybody was very worried about having a biocide in that high a concentration in that particular place. But People pretended to eat DDT on TV, and they said there was no problem with it, and so on. And it turned out there wasn't any uh, immediate nasty uh, toxicity uh, if you just ate some DDT or something. But most recently, the data have come out, and if your mother had high levels of DDT in her milk, your chances as a daughter uh, of getting breast cancer are something like four times higher. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are also poison <laughs> poisoning ourselves. There's a, an excellent new book out by Julian Cribb called Poison the Planet, which if you wear pants, if you read it, they'll scare them right off you. Mm. Well, I, I probably should read it, but um, I, I, I'll <laughs> probably read it through gapped fingers because I'm really steeped in this data. And uh, by the way, I'm old enough. I think I ran behind trucks spraying DDT through my neighborhood. I lived in Stratford, Connecticut when I was growing up, and I remember... When I was, I don't know, six or seven or eight or something, these trucks would roll by with spraying fog out to control mosquitoes, and, and we just thought that was the bomb as kids, so we would run behind it. I don't know what my parents were up to uh, while I was doing that, but at any rate, hopefully, I, I would think, though, that we've come along since then, and, and, and the neonicotinoid pesticides tell me we haven't. I mean, when, when you put something on a seed that's so, so toxic that the seed absorbs enough that the entire adult plant is systemically poisonous to anything that munches on it that's an insect. It's an astonishingly powerful thing. So nicotine, we might get ourselves with nicotine through the back door. You know, instead of smoking it in our lungs, we'll just wipe out the insects and someday we'll wake up and go, wow, insects were actually really important. Even the ones we weren't caring about, like honeybees and tracking. Uh, but it turned out that the midges and the other things and the ones we forgot to even name uh, were, were equally important. That we live in a highly complex ecological system we've got a very highly complex economic system and the keepers of the economic system are pretending like it's the only system that matters all the rest can be ignored uh and your message is maybe not exactly uh, you know there is uh an organization which certainly you and many of your listeners might want to join because it costs nothing and it keeps uh tries to keep all of these issues in in focus and focus on the big things like the scale of the human enterprise. It's called the mob. I don't know if you ever run into it, but you can find it at mahb.stanford.edu, mahb.stanford.edu. And again, it's trying to organize civil society to do something about these things that you and I have found so difficult to do anything about. Great. Now, I'm, I'm, I, in, the, in the minutes we have left, I'm wondering how do we turn this to um, well, I want to start with the title of a book that came out recently uh, that you're uh, featured in and part of. It's called 
Hope on Earth. Um, what? First off, uh, let's talk about the book real quickly, and then um, I'd love to hear your ideas on uh, what we can do. Well, the book actually was a recorded conversation between me and Michael Tobias right where I am now at uh, almost 10,000 feet in the Rockies. We were just discussing. We're right, basically, it's like the discussion you and I just had, uh, recorded and edited, and uh, we all both feel, uh, as we discussed, as you and I have just discussed, that uh, we know what to do, uh, and the hope on earth is to try and persuade people to just do it. And that's the big issue. And if uh, and if we can't, if we find we just have to live in a in societies where women are suppressed, where people of the wrong skin color are suppressed, where um, it's perfectly okay to take money from the poor uh, and give it to the rich, where it's perfectly okay to have a political party that tries to keep children from being fed by uh, attacking things like uh, the uh, uh, the food stamp program and so on. Uh, if we're going to continue that way, then there's no hope on earth. But there is hope on earth in the sense that there are many, many, many people who are concerned, as you said, uh, people who have the feeling rightly that we're killing our life support systems, people that have the feeling uh, that people are not being fairly treated, that food isn't distributed properly, that uh, the uh, a lot of the food industry is designed not to feed people but to make profits even if it kills the people and so on and so forth. Uh, if there's some way of getting all those people mobilized, then it may be that we can move in the right direction. Right now, I see no sign that we're going to move in the right direction on any issue. We have, for instance, a uh, one of the best presidents in some senses we've ever had, but under huge political pressure, so much so <clears throat> that he has to do some things that are, you know, he worries about climate change, but he has to announce that we can drill off the uh, uh, the shores of uh, uh, of the southeast. We can drill in Alaska. We can fight wars in the Middle East to make sure we get oil. Fighting for oil in the Middle East would be like if we were starving, fighting to get cyanide from the Middle East to eat. In other words, we shouldn't be burning oil. We shouldn't be killing our children uh, in battle or the children of other people in order to maintain access to oil. It's nuts, uh, but we do it, and even a president who knows better is forced to do it. Uh, can't get anything through Congress and so on. We need to totally, if we want to have hope, you got to totally change the way we govern ourselves. You got, as you indicated, we got to totally change the economic system. So you, you've indicated that most human beings, most Americans particularly, don't know what fractional reserve banking is. That banking is utterly dependent on continuous growth. Money is utterly dependent on continuous growth and generated basically as debt and comes out of thin air. It's got no other basis. And yet, uh, you know, as you said, people don't learn that in high school, do they? No. No, and, and the summary of this for me and what we're trying to do at, at Peak Prosperity is, is it's this simple and it's this hard. It's we need a new narrative. So our current narrative is we need economic growth and we're consumers. Uh, our narrative would be, no, we don't need growth. I don't need it personally. Um, and, and I'm not a consumer. I prefer to think of myself as a temporary inhabitant of this biosphere. I'm a steward at best. Uh, and, and so we really do need a revolution in, in how we our collective story, that whole story of be fruitful and multiply. I think that made sense, you know, a couple 10,000 years ago or so or whatever. Uh, but uh, it doesn't make sense today. But still, those stories drive us. And that's the thing I've been most personally frustrated with and invigorated by is trying to get my arms around. How do you change a story that's not true, but which people still believe in anyway? Um, and that's the tricky part. We've got to get peak prosperity tied into the mob because they have exactly the same kinds of goals. And uh, we we have too many outfits all trying to do the same thing and not coordinated. But, you know, you don't have to be brilliantly trained to understand what's going on. I, one of my very favorite stories is uh, Adam, my daughter, had a very close friend who was a very poor person who had escaped from um, uh, Honduras, I believe, Honduras or El Salvador. Uh, and uh, they be she, my daughter, our daughter befriended her. They became good friends. And one day, she, the woman said that I have been um, uh, telling my sister, who has gotten pregnant for the third time, that she's having too many children, that that's not right. And Lisa, our daughter, said, well, 
you know, you're Catholic. And they said, doesn't the Catholics say that you've got to be fruitful, multiply, uh, and uh, subdue the earth? And the woman said, ya conquistada, it's subdued already. And I thought there is a brilliant, uneducated woman who summarized the situation beautifully. Ya conquistada, we have subdued the earth already. We don't need to do any more subduing. <laughs> well, that's actually very well put. And uh, uh, if we could just get that message out, because so, not everybody's got that message yet so far. And of course, I think you, you got it nailed, which is when their interests collide with understanding that. Or as John Updike said, uh, never expect a man to understand something if his salary requires him not to. Um, right. That's kind of what we're up against here it, it is, is self-interest and all of that. But if humans don't move beyond self-interest, I think we'll do a lot of self-harm. At a high level, like you say, you know, even if humans do tremendous amounts of damage and wipe ourselves and a bunch of other things out, 10, 15 million years, the Earth will be back to its uh, old humming self um, with a different cast of characters. So I guess uh, at that level, things will be fine. So I'm not out to save the Earth anymore, but I am out to see if I can save humans. Um, and that project is very much uh, 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 an open project at this point with an uncertain ending. I don't know yet. Um, so yes, I would very much love to, to align efforts. I've had the same idea that there are a lot of individual groups pulling in different directions. It would be great if we could put some wood behind one arrow, at least on a couple of fronts and see if that could, that could go further. Because the, here's my hope, Paul, I, I work with people in their twenties a lot who are very different than I was in my twenties, who get the story, who've peered into the future, who, who don't think that they're being, uh, left a good a good earth or or being given a fair deal and and they're ready to do things differently um so i i think i think the energy is there for a change uh will it come in time i don't know convert them all into mobsters we've all got to become mobsters m-a-h-b dot stanford dot e-d-u we'll put the link right at the bottom of this and uh We'll make sure people go there. I will check it out myself, and uh, we'll see what we can do. And uh, I want to thank you very much for your time today, and uh, uh, really appreciate it. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Take care.